Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, my real pleasure to welcome you all again to this, uh, I think, 77. It's a very nice holy numbers, double seven uh, seminar <coughs> of uh, W2S webinar series on spintronics. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Narayana uh, Jamalamarka from IIT Hyderabad. He is working an associate professor there in the Department of Physics, a very good friend of mine. I'm glad that he agreed to give this talk on this platform. And uh, I'm very thankful uh, to you, Surya, on behalf of me and my committee. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, Rajbhusan, uh, Puspendra, Shakti, Ajar, and so on. So we uh, welcome you and welcome all the audience here, all the participants. I'm sure as we move on, people will still join in. So a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Surya Narayana. Uh, as I said, he is working as an associate professor at Department of Physics at IIT Hyderabad in India. Uh, his educational qualifications, uh, he obtained his MSc uh, in physics from University of Hyderabad. Then he moved to Indian Institute of Technology in, uh, or IIT Madras in Chennai. Um, and he got his PhD in 2007. Then uh, uh, he moved to uh, TIFR in uh, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Uh, as a postdoc, subsequently moved to National University of Singapore and then Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, where he has uh, learned and pursued interesting uh, research on nanomagnetism as well as on devices based on spin and semiconductors. Um, he has obtained uh, the uh, Professor A.L. Lasker Award for his contribution during his PhD for working on microstricty materials and transducers. He has uh, got more than 50 high impact international uh, journals and delivered number of seminars at different reported institutes in India as well as outside India. Uh, he has uh, actually filed two patents uh, for, to his credit and he was the recipient of the, uh, uh, or he visited the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany through the IIT DAD faculty exchange program in uh, 2014 and uh, 2018. Uh, he is a light member of the Magnetic Society of India, Indian Physical Association, Electron Microscopy India, and so on. Uh, he also received outstanding review recognition from JMMM. Uh, I'm happy I'm an editor there. So thank you for being a very valuable uh, uh, reviewer. Uh, he's working on uh, several interesting uh, topics uh, in uh, nanoscopic and mesoscopic magnetic materials and their realization for usage in practical devices such as spin electronics and optoelectronics. So with this uh, brief introduction, I again welcome uh, Surya to the seminar and all of you. Just make a short note that during the lecture, we don't take any questions. So if you have any pressing question, you kindly write in the chat box or raise your hand. And at the end of the lecture, we will take anyway all the questions. Uh, but before we take the question answer, just after the end of the lecture, we will take a group photo so I would request at that moment to turn on your camera for 30 seconds and we take what, a group photo and then take the question answer and uh, then we continue. Okay, so Surya, all yours. I'm uh, looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Professor Subankar Vedanta for your introduction. Okay, good evening to everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Surya Narana from Department of Physics, Indian University of Technology, Hyderabad. Uh, today I'm going to speak on uh, the domain wall dynamics and uh, spin transfer torque bias uh, in an inverse parallel alloy nanostructure. Okay, so before I go into the details of uh, the seminar, I just would like to brief about our uh, laboratory, which is uh, Magnetic Materials and Device Physics Laboratory. Um, the main topics that we work on uh, metal spintronics, uh, mesoscopic physics, and magnetic materials for energy and devices. Uh, these are some of uh, the important topics like uh, the cantilever sensing, the metal spintronics, magnetic thin films, then the resistor and the access memory and the quantum mechanical phenomena like quantum tunneling and uh, conductance quantization phenomena. Um, these are uh, our students 
like uh, who have been working very hardly i must uh, acknowledge them first and the work that i am going to present uh, has been carried out by mr apu kumar jana and uh, he he is going to submit his thesis uh, maybe in one week time or not one week time maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow he will be submitting his thesis so with this uh, brief introduction about our laboratory so i can uh, classify my work as uh, uh, spintronics the quantum phenomena and devices for the cognitive technologies so over here the cognitive technologies are for neuromorphic computing like uh, we develop uh, resistive random access memory uh, devices and test for them for the neuromorphic application we develop magnetic multi layers and study Uh, their domain wall dynamics and then uh, we also try to develop the devices out of this uh, magnetic multi layer and then the quantum mechanical phenomena we study uh, using the mechanically controlled break junction devices uh, we uh, we actually detect the tunneling currents and then uh, conductance quantization phenomena so the plan of the talk is uh, initially i would i would brief you about uh, the spintronic uh, then Uh, i'm going to spend little time on uh, the two important uh, results that we have obtained recently the thickness dependent uh, magnetic properties and uh, domain wall dynamics in uh, fe2c as a thin film and then uh, the second important thing is that uh, as we know that uh, the exchange bias is an important phenomena as far as the spintronic devices are concerned um, for an exchange bias phenomena to happen like we need to do the field cooling of the sample but however in this work what i am going to demonstrate you is that uh, by two ways so without uh, doing field cooling uh, uh, we could able to get exchange bias one is just by depositing uh, fe2 so as a uh, layer on top of iridium manganese layer the second thing is using the spin transfer torque phenomena so now uh, we know that uh, the moore's law moore's law uh, says that the number of uh, the transistors on silicon chip will uh, roughly double every 18 months so as we according to this law as we reduce the dimension of the devices or dimension of the transistors and other components um, the heat dissipation will be more and more and quantum mechanical effects will come into picture okay so to avoid this problem the new uh, electronics uh, has been started which is basically the spin electronics the spin electronics is basically the electronics based upon the spin of the electron okay the spin can have either up direction or the down direction and the spin electronics is basically the key for the spin electronics is control of uh, the spins by various means it can be an electric field or it can be a magnetic field or it can be a high frequency signal whatever may be so through some external parameters uh, one would control uh, the electron uh, uh, magnetization electron spin okay so now the question is what are the advantages of uh, uh, the spintronic devices some of the advantages are like uh, the more energy saving can be done and then more dense integration can be done and then high speed devices can be developed and extended the uh, moore's law if you look at various devices uh, those have been developed using this uh, spintronics the first important device uh, that i would like to name is the giant magnetic resistance device in the giant magnetic resistive device uh, there will be two ferromagnetic layers which will be separated by a non magnetic uh, metallic layer when a spin polarized uh, current comes if uh, both the magnetization states in the two ferromagnetic layers are parallel uh, the uh, the electron feel low resistance however if they are anti parallel uh, the electron feel the high resistance state so depending upon the parallel alignment or the anti parallel alignment the low resistance and high resistance of the device uh, is defined of course like when you apply the magnetic field one can also map the magnetic resistance of uh, the device so the amount of uh, the percentage of the magnetic resistance that has been uh, achieved using this giant magnetic resistive devices are of the order of uh, uh, 50% to 60% so later um, the tunnel magnetic resistive devices have been developed and over here in the tunnel magnetic resistive devices between two ferromagnetic layers the non magnetic uh, metal has been replaced with uh, oxide material the huge amount of uh, the tunnel magnetic resistance uh, has been uh, achieved but however uh, people could able to achieve uh, only uh, uh, not not too much but however to improve the tunnel magnetic resistive resistance of uh, the device 
the spin polarization of the material must be very high. So if we can have a material uh, which consists of 100% uh, spin polarization, um, the large amount of uh, the tunnel magnetic resistance can be uh, achieved. Okay, so in this direction, the lot of uh, research is going on and uh, a lot of materials are being developed. So which I'm going to discuss in today's lecture. And apart from that, uh, the spin wall structures uh, have been developed and these spin wall structures, uh, they will work like a wall uh, for the electron flow uh, or the spin flow. And uh, based on the tunnel magnetic resistance device, the magnetic random access memories have been developed. So over here in the magnet magnetic random access memory device, um, the tunnel magnetic resistance device is sandwiched between the bit line and the word line. So the amount of current that we send through this bit line and the word line is sufficient to flip the magnetization state uh, in the free layer so that uh, one can have the parallel configuration and the anti-parallel configuration. If you have the parallel configuration, the tunnel magnetic resistance uh, will be read as minimum. And if you have anti-parallel configuration, the tunnel magnetic resistance will be maximum. So as I mentioned, like uh, uh, the materials aspects is very, very important as far as the spintronic uh, device development is concerned. The sum of the important uh, spintronic materials that uh, people have been developing are uh, some oxides, the chromium oxide and iron oxide, fossilor alloy material, and then the some double perovskite material and uh, transition metal uh, chalcogenide. Now, if you look at uh, Hasler alloy materials. The Hasler alloy materials, they have found variety of uh, uh, magnetic properties and it also show the half metallic nature. So over here, if you look at uh, the band diagram of uh, the Hasler alloy material, so it acts like a conductor for uh, one spin polarization and uh, uh, insulator for the another spin polarization. For the down spin, it will act like a insulator. For the up spin, it will act like a conductor. So as far as their uh, Curie temperatures are concerned, it is also very important to look uh, whether the Curie temperature of that particular material is very high or not, so that uh, uh, one would be able to uh, use these materials for the device uh, applications. Okay, it must be above the room temperature. The Curie temperature must be above the room temperature. The Hasler alloy materials are the one which have Curie temperatures above the room temperature. So these uh, Hasler alloy materials, they have relatively high Curie temperatures. And then uh, some of the important properties of these Hasler alloy uh, compounds are uh, uh, itinerant and local magnetism, uh, antiferromagnetism, helimagnetism, polyparamagnetism, and uh, heavy fermionic behavior. So now the question, you can ask me a question, what is the importance of uh, these Hasler alloy materials as far as the spintronic applications are concerned? For instance, if you have a, a non-polarized uh, current, uh, when you send uh, this non-polarized current through uh, Hasler alloy materials, which is basically the spin polarized, the current will be spin polarized on the other end. So one can also use this Hasler alloy uh, thin films as uh, uh, filters, the spin filters as well. So as I mentioned, like uh, the Hasler alloy materials can be uh, can be used in the GMR and TMR device. In the GMR and TMR device. The ferromagnetic uh, material can be replaced with the Hasler alloy materials, and if if uh, the barrier is uh, non-magnetic material, that is called as a GMR, and if the barrier is uh, oxide materials, that is called uh, the TMR material. So this GMR, TMR, and spin wall structures will be used in the magnetic storage devices and also in the uh, magnetic uh, uh, sensor devices. So so if you look. Um, if, if the, if the uh, orientation of the magnetic moment in both uh, ferromagnetic layers is uh, parallel, uh, we call it as a low resistance state. If it is anti-parallel, we call it as a high resistance state. And the corresponding magnetic resistance can be defined as uh, uh, RAP minus RP by RP. So if the magnetic resistance is very high, the sensitivity, will all, sensitivity of the device will also be very high. So more the magnetic resistance, suppose if you get 1000% of uh, the GMR or TMR, the, the, the amount of magnetic fields that you can detect will be uh, very high. The sensitivity of the device will be very high. So another important uh, concept that I would like to discuss over here is uh, the exchange bias phenomena. So the exchange bias um, is basically um, um, an interfacial phenomena. 
So this can be achieved by cooling the ferromagnetic, uh, antiferromagnetic interface uh, uh, through the nil temperature of uh, uh, nil temperature of uh, antiferromagnetic material um, through field cooling phenomena. Okay. So for instance, if you consider this A diagram, so initially uh, one has to make sure that uh, uh, the temperature of the system is above the nil temperature and below the Curie temperature of the material so that uh, the spins in the antiferromagnetic material will be randomly oriented and uh, the spins in the ferromagnetic material are oriented in one direction. So once we cool uh, the sample through nil temperature of antiferromagnetic material uh, through field cooling process, the spins of uh, the ferromagnetic materials will be pinned at the interface due to the antiferromagnetic interface. So due to the spinning, when we try to do the magnetic field versus magnetization graph, uh, one need to apply a larger amount of uh, magnetic field to reverse the magnetization. As a result of this fact, there will be shift of uh, hysteresis loop along the magnetic field axis. So this shift is called as uh, the exchange bias. This exchange bias phenomena has been used in many, many devices, TMR device, TMR device, and uh, also in uh, spin wall structures. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the Hassler allies, as I mentioned, like the Hassler allies are the one which are having very high spin polarization. We must understand uh, the structure of uh, this Hassler alloy compounds. So, the Hassler alloy consists of uh, four. Uh, they they will form in four variety of uh, uh, structures. Uh, one is the full Hassler alloy. So, along the diagonal, along the diagonal, the atomic arrangement will be like X, Y, X, Z. Whereas in the inverse Hassler alloy. The atomic arrangement along the diagonal will be x x y z. The quaternary Hausdorff allies. The along the diagonal, the atomic arrangement will be x y x prime z, and in the semi Hausdorff ally, it will be x y and z. So there exist uh, disordered phases. Suppose if uh, the intermixing of uh, y and z happens, that is called uh, B two phase, and if the intermixing happens between x y and z, that is called A two phase. So these Hausdorff alloys uh, found to follow the slater polling curve, and it is, which is basically the half metallicity rule. So the slater polling curve is essentially between the total number of uh, the valence electrons versus uh, the total spin magnetic moment Mt. So which is defined as uh, Zt minus 18 uh, in case of uh, the semi Hausdorff alloy materials. Over here, Zt is the sum of uh, the spin up and spin down electrons. And uh, in case of semi Hausdorff alloys, total of uh, nine minority spin bands would be there. And in case of uh, full Hausdorff alloy, total of uh, 12 minority spin bands will be there. And correspondingly, 12 uh, spin majority spin bands will be there. And in case of uh, inverse Hausdorff alloys, we have various combinations like 9, 12, and 14. So among all these compounds, the Fe2CuSA is a quite promising compound because of the fact that uh, it consists of very high magnetic moment, 4.9 to Bohr magneton, and Curie temperature is of the order of uh, 1038 Kelvin. But although it shows uh, uh, an attracting magnetic properties, but uh, the very few experiments have been conducted on this compound. So that is the reason why uh, we have we, we were very much interested in exploring the domain wall dynamics and other properties on this compound. So uh, before I go into the details of uh, the results, I also would like to introduce uh, another important concept, which is called as the spin transfer torque. So basically like uh, when we try to send an unpolarized current through spin polarized material, the current will be spin polarized. And when the spin polarized current passes through, um, passes through a ferromagnetic material where the domains and domain walls exist. So these um, uh, this spin polarized current will transfer the momentum momentum to the magnetic moment which exists in the sample. Uh, because of uh, the conservation of the angular momentum, there will be motion of uh, the domain wall happens. So which is based for uh, many domain wall motion devices. So essentially the domain, uh, the domain walls uh, in a magnetic nanowire can be, can be moved uh, with the spin transfer torque phenomena. Uh, this spin transfer torque phenomena um, um is is very very important to move the domain walls within the ferromagnetic nanowire so now uh, the dynamics of uh, the spin can be understood by the landau lipschitz and gilbert equations or here the rate of change of magnetization consists of uh, two parts one is the precisional term 
another one is the damping term now if you look at uh, if you introduce uh, the concept of uh, the spin transfer torque and if you look at uh, the uh, landau lipschitz and gilbert equation so in addition to this precisional term on the damping term we will also have two more important uh, uh, parts one is adiabatic spin transfer torque term and another one is uh, the non adiabatic spin transfer torque term the adiabatic spin transfer torque term the spin of the conduction electron will follow the local magnetic moment in the adiabatic spin transfer torque whereas in the non adiabatic spin transfer torque the spin of uh, the conduction electron will not follow the uh, local magnetic moment direction which leads to the domain wall resistance okay so in the spin transfer torque uh, bias phenomena that i am going to explain so we use this uh, non adiabatic spin transfer torque term and try to explain um, the spin transfer torque bias phenomena in the uh, infinitely long ferromagnetic nanowire so the first uh, part of uh, uh, my discussion is about uh, the thickness dependent uh, magnetic properties and domain wall dynamics in fe2c as a thin film so in order to uh, understand the domain wall dynamics and the magnetic properties of uh, these films initially we have deposited uh, um, fe2c as a films uh, on top of uh, silicon silicon dioxide so to avoid the oxidation um, we tried to deposit the tantalum on top of fe2c as a the thickness of uh, fe2c as a uh, has been varied as uh, 5 10 15 and 20 nanometers so this is a kind of uh, the ga xrd the grazing instance x ray diffraction pattern that we have obtained what you could see is that uh, we could see two peaks uh, one peak corresponds to silicon and another peak corresponds to fe2c as a so from this we confirm the phase of uh, fe2c as a and the lattice parameter we also calculated and that exactly matches with uh, the value of uh, the literature we also try to see the cross sectional trans uh, transmission electron microscope uh, images uh, for the uh, for for measuring the thickness of the sample and we could see we could very clearly see distinction between different layers and composition of the material uh, has been confirmed with uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy we could see the exact composition of it to csa also to understand the, the microstructural behavior or microstructure or uh, diffraction at the nano scale we also try to do uh, said pattern said rings and what we could see is that uh, uh, we could see diffraction rings corresponds to fe 2 csa from this we confirm that uh, uh, indeed uh, our films are crystalline in nature um, and uh, the space group corresponds to uh, our films uh, they are basically related to fe 2 csa so in order to understand the morphological studies we have studied uh, we have done the atomic force microscopic uh, studies uh, as you could see here um, uh, from 5 nanometers to 20 nanometers um, the uniformity of uh, the film has been increased okay so essentially at 5 nanometers the density of uh, the magnetic grains the density of grains are less and at 20 nanometers the density um, is very high the density is very high okay so as a result of uh, uh, the difference in the density of the grain it may so happen that uh, the intergrain interactions intergrain interactions may be different and this will also influence uh, the magnetization reversal phenomena in order to understand the uh, magnetostatic interactions the magnetostatic interactions of uh, these films and to understand the magnetization reversal reversal phenomena we try to do uh, forc the first order reversal curves the first order reversal curves are basically uh, can be obtained by initially by saturating uh, the magnetization loop up to by, by saturating the up to positive saturation then apply a reversal field then again uh, back to the positive saturation so if you repeat uh, this one for several times you can get uh, the first order reversal curves like this so now the importance of uh, um, this frc the first order reversal curves is that one can actually get information about uh, intra and interparticle interaction then uh, identification of magnetic impurities one can one can identify the magnetic impurities the range of coercivity distribution how the coercivity is distributed within the sample 
and domain state configuration you can actually say whether whether you have the single domain or multi domain or super paramagnetic state or the vortex state so all this all this information can be obtained from the first order reversal curves okay so on all the films we try to do frc curve in a short while i'm going to uh, show you those results so another most important uh, parameter that one can obtain uh, uh, using the frc uh, curves are basically the switching field distribution and also the magnetostatic interactions can be approximated by determining the switching field distribution and the distribution function is basically minus half del square m by del br so basically double derivative of the magnetization with respect to the the reversal magnetic field so these are the kind of uh, frc diagrams that we have obtained for various uh, uh, thickness films like for 5 10 uh, 15 and 20 nanometers the first thing that we have observed is that uh, with an increase in the thickness the number of lines inside the major uh, mh loop enhances so for 5 nanometers we don't see many lines for 10 a uh, few more are there for 15 a uh, few more are there and for 20 you could see many uh, many lines in the major mh curves okay so this could be due to uh, the fact that uh, as i mentioned like uh, the density of the grains within the 5 nanometer uh, film are very less <coughs> the magnetostatic interactions are very less and this leads to uh, this leads to um, um, I mean, this, I mean, this, this, this uh, uh, because of the density of uh, the film is very less. The distribution of the field is very less. So that is the reason why um, we don't see many lines in the uh, fine nanometer of course. But however, as the thickness of the material, thickness of the film increases, the uh, magnetostatic interactions are also more and more, and which leads to more and more uh, reversal fields. Okay. So we also try to plot the switching field distribution with respect to the reversal field what we could see is that uh, the switching field distribution intensity uh, has been decreased from 5 nanometers to 20 nanometers this also endorses that uh, the magnetostatic interactions uh, are are more and more as you go to higher and higher thickness and apart from that if you could see the the uh, full width at off maximum full width at off maximum increases with the thickness Again, which endorses uh, the increasing uh, the strength of the interaction between the grains, between the magnetic grains. So we also plotted uh, the FORC distribution, the contour graph. Uh, from the contour graph, uh, um, using this uh, distribution function, and from the contour graph, what we can say is that it is basically on x-axis, we have BC, and on y-axis, uh, it is BU. So the, the contour diagram, it is symmetric. For five nanometer film, so that means that uh, whenever uh, you have a symmetric contour diagram, uh, you can say that uh, you have a single domain. But however, um, uh, as as uh, as the thickness of the film increases to ten nanometer, we do see shift of this contour diagram to the negative side. So, which essentially demonstrates that uh, the magnetostatic interactions are increasing little bit. And for fifteen nanometers, we do see multiple domains. And uh, for uh, um, uh, 20 nanometers, we do see the merging of the domains, and then the more and more magnetostatic interactions exist uh, in the 20 nanometer film. Okay, so just by having the position of, just by knowing the information about the position of uh, the contour diagram, you can actually say whether it is in the single domain state or the multi domain state. But of course, since we don't uh, uh, have the super paramagnetic state and uh, the vortex state in our system. Uh, we don't see uh, the, the the behavior of uh, the super paramagnetic and vortex state. But for instance, if we have uh, a system which is having uh, the vortex state and the super paramagnetic state, you will also be able to see uh, corresponding changes in this contour diagram. So this is uh, the magnetic field versus magnetization graph for uh, for the uh, fe 2 c say thin films. What we do see is that we do see a saturation. Uh, at a two kilo isotope for all the films except for five nanometers. So this could be due to the fact that uh, uh, the number of grains, the number of grains in the five nanometer films are less. And in order to understand uh, this phenomena, uh, we try to do uh, micromagnetic simulations using the MIMIC software, and we also try to increase the number of non-magnetic inclusions. 
what we could see is that uh, as we increase the void radius, the void radius, uh, the coercivity also increases up to certain value, and after that it decreases. So it is because of this reason, as the non as the non magnetic inclusions are more uh, in the fine nanometer film, we do see a little more amount of uh, uh, coercivity uh, for fine nanometer film. But however, um, uh, for higher uh, thickness, for higher thickness, we do see an increase in the coercivity of uh, of the film. Okay, so the increase of uh, the coercivity, um, increase of the coercivity, if if uh, in a system in a thin film. Uh, if the if there is an increase in the coercivity, <coughs> that leads to the nil domain wall, and the decrease of the coercivity. Uh, if if the coercivity decreases as you increase the thickness, that can lead to the block domain wall. So again, uh, further to confirm, um, for iron and cobalt, if you want to have the nil domain walls in the film, the thickness must be less than 14 nanometers in case of iron, and in case of cobalt. Uh, it must be 16 nanometer so as uh, we are we are we are dealing uh, with the system of a fine nanometer we do believe that uh, the nil domain walls exist in our sample okay so hence the nil domain wall model is applicable for our film and we also try to do uh, the longitudinal mock for the domain wall dynamics so as as i mentioned like uh, whatever uh, magnetization loops that we have obtained they are in plane in plane magnetization loops and uh, we do have the in-plane magnetization. For that, uh, we perform <coughs> longitudinal uh, magneto-optical care effect. So this is uh, the kind of uh, the magnetization loop that we have obtained using the LMAC setup. And we also try to map the domain images at each and every stage of uh, this magnetization loop. So as you could see here uh, in, the, in, the, in the domain images, um, for the film with uh, thickness pi nanometer, we do see uh, the band type of domains with a sliding motion. But however, <coughs> when the thickness of the film is more than pi nanometer, we do see ripple kind of domains, ripple kind of domains. And for 15 nanometers and for 20 nanometers, the ripple size increase. And again, the ripple kind of uh, domains persist for all the thin films except for pi nanometers. Okay. On top of that, uh, we do see uh, the higher anisotropy regions, the higher anisotropy regions uh, at some places in the films. So to understand uh, the anisotropic behavior of uh, our films, we also try to do the uh, magnetic force microscopy studies. And from the magnetic force microscopy study, we have taken the FFT. And from the FFT, we confirm that uh, we have the fourfold anisotropy plus twofold anisotropy in case of uh, um, in case of 15 nanometer film, okay. So, um, so I mean, like uh, to understand more about uh, um, this uh, anisotropic behavior, we also try to plot the switching field versus coercivity. And these coercivity values we have obtained using uh, the magneto optical care effect. So, what we could see is that for five nanometer, uh, there is a perfect fourfold anisotropy in the film. But as the thickness of uh, the film increases, we do see uh, a fourfold anisotropy in addition to the twofold anisotropy, so which exactly matches with the FFT of uh, um, the MFM uh, magnetic force microscopy image. So now the question is uh, for the device application, uh, it is very important to um, uh, establish the exchange bias. Okay, so for that reason, uh, we try to um, we try to we try to deposit we try to deposit. Um, the fe 2 cvsi film on top of uh, the iridium manganese iridium manganese uh, antiferromagnetic material okay so on top of fe 2 cvsi we deposited the tantalum uh, and the thickness of the tantalum is 2 nanometer which act like a capping layer okay so essentially we wanted to establish uh, an exchange bias phenomena um, in this system iridium manganese and fe 2 cvsi so the structure of uh, the iridium manganese uh, is, uh, is depicted over here. It, it actually attains a face centered cubic structure. So, this is a kind of uh, X ray diffraction pattern that we have obtained, J X ray diffraction pattern. So, it is very much clear that uh, we have both uh, the iridium manganese phase and Fe2CVSI phase uh, uh, in our J XRD pattern. 
and also like uh, uh, the uh, iridium manganese attains uh, the 111 direction and f 2 cysa consists of 220 direction. This is the cross-sectional TEM that we have obtained. Like uh, there is a clear distinction between various layers, and also SAID pattern confirms that uh, uh, this layer is a fe 2 cysa layer, and this layer is uh, iridium manganese layer. So this has been confirmed based on uh, the HKL values that we have obtained from the SAID pattern. So we also tried to do uh, MFM, uh, the, sorry, VSM um, for uh, the single layer and for the bilayer sample. So as you could see here, uh, for a single layer, we don't see any any shift of uh, the magnetization loop. Uh, the magnetization loop is symmetric around uh, zero. But however, as soon as we deposited f 2 cysa on top of uh, radium manganese layer, we do see a shift of uh, the magnetization loop. But please remember that uh, we didn't we didn't do any field cooling over here. We didn't do any field cooling over here. Without field cooling, uh, immediately in as deposited film, we could see a shift of uh, the magnetization loop. Okay. So the exchange bias value, uh, the shift, the, this is shift we have calculated, and this uh, exchange bias value is found to be uh, 420 I step. So it has been predicted that uh, uh, if the iridium manganese is along uh, uh, is is along 111 texture then the exchange bias can be induced without field cooling phenomena so that is what happened even in our system so as soon as uh, we, we we confirm the um, texture of iridium manganese along 111 direction so because of this texture we could see a shift of uh, the magnetization loop without field cooling process so it also consists of uh, the uniaxial anisotropy uh, the uniaxial anisotropy has been confirmed from uh, the uh, polar plot. So basically, uh, we calculated uh, the exchange bias at different angles, and we tried to plot this one with respect to uh, exchange bias variation. What we could see is that we could see um, um, uniaxial anisotropy, uniaxial anisotropy along uh, the 45 degrees angle. We also varied uh, the thickness of uh, antiferromagnetic layer and the ferromagnetic layer. What we could see is that uh, uh, when we try to vary the antiferromagnetic layer thickness, initially there is no exchange bias, and all of a sudden there is an exchange bias, and then again it's decreased. So this uh, kind of behavior uh, is well established, and uh, it has been explained based upon the random field model. Essentially, when the thickness of the film is uh, less than TC, so since there is a less anisotropy, there is no exchange bias. But however, when T is uh, of the order of uh, TC, the onset of uh, the exchange bias happens. But when T is greater than TC, the random anisotropy decreases with uh, the antiferromagnetic layer thickness. And this can be the decrease of uh, the exchange bias uh, can be explained based upon the spin flop coupling. So essentially, if you look at uh, uh, this equation E, there is a linear part and there is a biquadratic part. So because of this biquadratic part, so there will be frustrated perpendicular spins at the interface. So as the thickness of uh, the iridium manganese layer more is more and more, the frustrated perpendicular spins at the interface will be more. So essentially, the second part of this equation will be more and more, so which leads to the decrease of uh, the exchange bias with the iridium manganese layer thickness. So then um, to again further to confirm, whether there exists an exchange bias or not, we also try to do the magneto-optical care effect studies. We do see shift of uh, the magnetization loop uh, from the magneto-optical care effect. And we also try to see that uh, the direction of uh, the magnetic domains that we have obtained. So the direction of uh, the magnetic domains is along the 45 degrees angle, 45 degrees angle. And if you, if you see um, the fe 2 cysa uh, single layer, we don't see, um, we do see um, a ripple kind of domains in the single layer. But however, uh, as soon as we deposit uh, fe 2 cysa on top of iridium manganese layer, we do see um, the patch kind of domains, the patch kind of domains. So basically, um, patch kind of domains uh, would come into picture when there is an interfacial pinning, uh, interfacial pinning that leads to the patch kind of domains in our present system. And we also try to uh, 
uh, get the mock images at different angles and we do see a, a, a clear shift of the magnetization loop along the magnetic field axis, even from uh, mock as well. So from this, we confirm that uh, uh, indeed there exists an exchange bias in our film uh, without uh, even field cooling, which could be due to the 111 texture of uh, the iridium manganese uh, thin film. Okay. And another, uh, another conclusion that uh, we made is that uh, uh, exchange bias makes the ripple to patch type of domains. Okay. So essentially due to uh, the interfacial pinning. So we do have the patch kind of domains. So the, the easy axis is along 45 degrees and this 45 degrees uh, angle is confirmed by plotting the graph between uh, the angle dependent or the polar um, angle and the exchange bias values. We do see um, the uniaxial anisotropy along the 45 degrees angle. <coughs> so to understand more about uh, uh, the kind of coupling that exists between uh, the anti-ferromagnetic uh, iridium manganese and ferromagnetic uh, uh, Fe2CVSA, uh, we also have performed uh, uh, micromagnetic simulations using uh, MUMAX. What we could see is that uh, uh, we tried to vary the coupling strength between uh, anti AFM and uh, ferromagnetic layers. And at a different coupling strength, uh, we tried to calculate uh, the exchange bias values. As I mentioned, like uh, uh, in our experiment, we could get the exchange bias value of uh, 420 I states. This 420 I state value exactly matches with uh, the coupling constant of 4.138 uh, into 10 power minus 12 joule per meter okay so this is this is the amount of uh, uh, coupling strength that exists uh, between our ferromagnetic and uh, anti ferromagnetic layer uh, to obtain um, an exchange bias value of uh, 420 i state again like uh, at the interface we also try to get uh, the uh, um, domain images we do see patch kind of domains so even in the micromagnetic simulation so these patch kind of domains exactly mimics with uh, the kind of patch domains that we have obtained using the magnet optical care effect. So, which essentially uh, confirms that there is uh, internal matching between various experiments that we have performed. So, this gave us a lot of confidence on our data. Now, the question is that uh, um, is it possible to have exchange bias without uh, uh, anti ferromagnetic layer? We don't want to have an anti ferromagnetic layer, but still we wanted to have exchange bias. So, I mean, like we have done uh, extensive micromagnetic simulations, so, and then we propose that uh, the spin transfer torque phenomena indeed can give uh, the exchange bias without having uh, the antiferromagnetic layer. So in a short while, I'm going to explain that. Okay, so, so basically what we have done is we have taken uh, an infinitely long uh, Fe2CVSA nanowire. That means that uh, the infinite long wire uh, in the sense that uh, we removed the surface charges at the edges. We removed the surface charges at the edges. And then um, uh, we tried to uh, send the spin polarized current through the nanowire. And then we tried to uh, change the angle, change the angle, uh, angle between the magnetic field and uh, the nanowire length. Okay. So what we could see is that uh, when J is equal to zero, when the current density and the spin transfer torque uh, is zero, we don't see any shift for the magnetization loop. Okay. Now, when we try to send the spin polarized current, and then when we try to sweep the magnetic field direction, we do see a shift for the magnetization loop. Okay. So this shift, uh, we call it as a spin transfer torque bias. Okay, so the over here the H was swept at various angles with respect to the length of the wire, and we disabled the demagnetization field and also neglected the end surface charges. Otherwise, it is very difficult to get uh, the infinitely long nano wire. Now, as I mentioned, like we tried to change the angle 0 degrees, 30 degrees, 90 degrees, 150, and 180 degrees. So at different angles. Uh, at zero degrees, we do see the shift of the magnetization loop on the positive field axis. And for 180 degrees angle, we do see shift of uh, the hysteresis loop along the negative field axis. So the advantage of uh, uh, the spin transfer torque bias is that you don't have to, you don't have to have anti-ferromagnetic layer, 
but just by changing the angle between the magnetic field and uh, the length of the wire you can actually uh, tune the exchange bias values from the positive value to the negative value but of course like if, if someone can uh, prove this one experimentally so it will be uh, miraculous in the spintronics area so whatever that i am uh, that i am showing here it is basically on the simulation basis so to understand this phenomena to understand this phenomena like uh, as i mentioned like by changing the angle between the magnetic field and the length of the wire by sending the spin polarized current we do see uh, a shift of uh, the hysteresis loop and we try to calculate the exchange bias value at zero uh, angle uh, we do see very high uh, uh, spin transfer torque bias and at 180 degrees uh, the spin transfer torque bias is uh, uh, is also very high at 90 degrees we don't see any spin transfer torque bias okay so now if you look at uh, uh, the left hand side fan left hand left hand side fan um, we have j is equal to 0 that means the current density the spin transfer torque is zero over here and the magnetic field only swept and over here also the j is zero the spin transfer torque is zero uh, only the magnetic field is swept and we do see a smooth variation for the domain wall Uh, within the wire okay as soon as we switch on the spin transfer torque bias we don't see a smooth variation for the domain wall within the nano wire but however uh, we do see different uh, variant colors for the domain wall okay suppose um, uh, we also we also map in which direction the magnetic moment would be depending upon the color code for instance if uh, if we have the white color that means it is in the z direction if you have black color it is in the minus z direction if you have yellow color it is in plus y direction if it is in blue color it is in the minus y direction okay so now uh, when we try to send the spin polarized current when you try to send uh, the spin transfer torque bias uh, through the magnetic nano wire um, instead of moving smoothly the domain wall the domain wall actually rotating its its spin orientation spin orientation in helical fashion helical fashion so because of this there will be a domain wall resistance domain wall resistance that leads to the shift of uh, uh, hysteresis loop along the magnetic field axis okay so uh, we attribute uh, uh, such kind of uh, uh, domain wall resistance uh, could be due to uh, the fourth term that exists in the landau lipschitz and gilbert equation which is basically the non adiabatic spin transfer torque term so suppose if you look at uh, the non adiabatic spin transfer torque term uh, which is basically m cross uh, do m by do x the magnetization is always in the x positive x direction the magnetization is in x direction that means in the i direction the do m by do x the do m do, do m by do x um, if it is if it is in the um, uh, my, my j direction if it is in the uh, k if it is in the k direction z direction so the resultant will be uh, m cross uh, do m by do x will be in the j direction now again i cross j it will be in the minus k direction and so on so the direction of uh, the spin which exists in the domain wall will keep changing and as you supply uh, the spin transfer torque term continuously uh, there will be motion of the domain wall and as a result of uh, this domain wall resist there will be spiral motion for the uh, spin motion which leads to the shift of uh, the magnetization loop on the magnetic field axis the similar thing happened uh, on the negative side uh, the negative exchange bias phenomena it is because uh, we have we have changed the current direction in the opposite direction that leads to the negative um, negative exchange bias okay so as you could see here in this uh, image you can see such kind of uh, motion of uh, the domain wall like which attains the helical motion uh, which leads to the domain wall resistance for the film for the nano wire so what i would like to convey you is that because of this uh, non adiabatic spin transfer torque term uh, the domain wall would attain the helical motion would attain the helical motion and leads to the domain wall resistance that gives uh, Uh, as the spin transfer torque bias in the system um, as you could see here at 90 degrees we don't see any exchange bias phenomena spin transfer torque uh, bias or here because of uh, the coherent rotation of the domain wall 
uh, in the 90 degrees. We don't see anything over there. That exactly matches with our simulation. So to understand more about uh, the spin transfer torque by a phenomena, we also tried to vary the current density and calculated the spin transfer torque. We do see a linear variation for the spin transfer torque. And even with the polarization constant, as you increase uh, the polarization constant, uh, um, uh, we do see an increase in the um, spin transfer torque by us. Okay. Also, we also varied the non adiabaticity, now zeta term, zeta term, and we do see this kind of variation. We fitted uh, this non adiabaticity term with this expression. Okay. So, this is the expression uh, which is mentioned here, which is mentioned here, the Lando Lipschitz and Gilbert equation. We, we fitted uh, um, this variation with the Lando Lipschitz and Gilbert equation. What we could see, uh, we extracted uh, parameters of uh, BJ and CJ uh, from this fitting. So the values that we have obtained are depicted over here. If you could see here, the BJ value is less in comparison with uh, CJ value. But however, in general, the BJ will be greater than CJ. The adiabatic uh, spin transfer torque term uh, will be higher in comparison with the non adiabatic spin transfer torque term. Okay. But however, uh, in our system, uh, in which the infinitely long uh, F2C was a nanowire, we do see um, a larger value of uh, non adiabatic term. Okay. So from this, we confirm that uh, uh, the non adiabatic uh, uh, spin transfer torque term is responsible for the um, uh, spin transfer torque bias in our system. So apart from that, we also try to vary the anisotropy of the system, and we do see an increase in the uh, spin transfer torque uh, bias as we increase uh, the anisotropy. So then, um, I mean, like we wanted to see whether uh, this the observed spin transfer torque uh, bias, um, whether it is specific to fe 2 cvsa or not, or it can be applicable for other ferromagnetic system as well. We, we also try to uh, take other model systems like uh, Fermilli and iron. We do see similar effect uh, in other systems as well. But instead, like uh, the, the, the difference, the difference that we have uh, seen um, in comparison with the FE2CVSA is that um, we do see more spin transport or bias in case of uh, iron, uh, um, like among Fermilli, iron, and FE2CVSA. The more amount of uh, spin transfer torque bias has been observed in the um, iron sample. So to understand more about uh, uh, more spin transfer torque bias in the iron system, we also tried to took the snapshots of uh, uh, micromagnetic images. We do see a, a short domain wall for iron case in comparison with f 2 cvsa That means that uh, the DX term in the non-adiabatic spin transfer torque uh, is very small that leads to the larger value of uh, m cross dou m by dou x, which leads to the higher resistance, higher resistance for the domain wall. Okay. So if, if the domain wall width, if the domain wall width is small, then the resistance will also be very high because this dou delta x is in the denominator that leads to high resistance for the domain wall. As we have high resistance for the domain wall, uh, the more and more spin transfer torque bias can be observed in the uh, system. But on the other on the other on the other hand, if you look at uh, the Fermilli, the 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 domain wall width is between uh, fe 2 cvsa and iron. So that is the reason why uh, we do see um, a we do see a moderate uh, spin transfer torque bias in the Fermilli. So as far as the conclusions of uh, uh, my talk uh, is concerned, like uh, um, uh, we do see uh, domain state configuration in fe 2 cvsa thin films, we do see the transformation of uh, single domain to multi domain and then to the nucleation and uh, we also try to see uh, uh, we also try to see the fourfold plus uh, twofold anisotropy um, in the in the f 2 cvsa system then um, we could able to induce exchange bias uh, without field cooling in the f 2 cvsa system uh, using the uh, property of uh, uh, iridium manganese uh, 111 texture and then finally, uh, we also tried to uh, establish the spin transfer torque bias uh, due to the domain wall resistance uh, in the fe 2 cvsa infinitely long wire. So indeed, it is not only specific to fe 2 cvsa but uh, 
we could able to show the spin transfer torque bias phenomena in other systems like permalloy and iron sample the variation in the spin transfer torque bias uh, uh, in uh, in in uh, um, from ferro for one ferromagnetic system to other ferromagnetic system has been attributed to the domain wall width as the domain wall width is smaller and smaller the domain wall uh, resistance will be high which leads to higher spin transfer torque bias with this i would like to thank uh, for your attention uh, now the questions are welcome from the audience yeah thank you so much uh, surya for this uh, very nice talk uh, so on behalf of everyone <clears throat> i thank uh, before we take the questions uh, i request uh, all of you uh, to switch on your camera and surya please stop sharing for a minute yeah, yeah i will stop yeah. then we take some group photo and then we'll come back to the question answer yeah. oh hello dell very nice to see you okay hello yeah. i request all of you to please turn on your camera okay okay now i'm taking few snapshots Thank you. Smile. One more photo. Still many people have not switched on camera. Okay, so we are almost done. Maybe some more. Uh, okay, so uh, please turn off your cameras and Surya, you please again share your screen. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, so uh, anybody has any questions or I will begin with some questions. So uh, maybe we go to this, uh, we stay with the summary slide. That's good enough. Yeah. The anisotropy part, when you say there is a fourfold symmetry. Yeah. Actually, uh, it is not very clear from this plot because fourfold symmetry means uh, it should like go down and there should be a peak and then there should be four peaks, but <coughs> here it looks like almost isotropic actually with some little tendency. Yeah. Some, some little tendency, yes, yeah. So fourfold plus twofold, both are there in the system. It is not very clear. I mean, it is more towards isotropic actually, Surya. If no, you isotropic plot... means like you must get a circular kind of fashion, but if you look at, if you look at for five nanometers, hmm. You do see a very clear fourfold anisotropy. Yeah, you are making the polar plot. Actually, if you make a simple uh, uh, x y plot, okay, then you will see in the peaks will not be very significant. That is, the between the peak and the mm, the normal um, the label, mm -hmm. it is not big difference. So it is not very anisotropic. But, but however, if you look at uh, the um, FFT of the MFM image. We do see very clear fourfold anisotropy. I don't know. The FFT of MFM is a good idea to actually quantify the anisotropy. But at least we get some idea about what kind of anisotropy. <coughs> so this is very, very qualitative and probably vague uh, from the MFM. But the uh, polar plots are more quantitative. So since, we people, got, uh, since we got uh, the similar behavior in MFM and uh, this polar plot, we we do feel like uh, there is a fourfold anisotropy along with the twofold anisotropy. Very I encourage mild. you to look at uh, <clears throat> through ferromagnetic resonance. Okay. That is the best technique. Yeah. Quantify and uh, sure. yeah. probably get more information. But these plots uh, doesn't indicate uh, anisotropic behavior. Okay. It's some little anisotropy is there, but it's almost isotropic. You can say. Okay. But uh, yeah. but do do you think so? Because uh, here, if you look. Um, I mean, it is not isotropic even, like uh, there is, uh, yeah, is a little bit, for, uh, as I said. there but is look, an indication <clears throat> for fourfold anisotropy as well, twofold. Yeah, so uh, if you look the bottom corner plot mm -hmm. for the, yes. the exchange wire system, there is twofold anisotropy, yes. uh, definitely, but in the top one uh, have some observation, but okay, maybe more investigation. Needs yeah, to we, I mean, we will take your suggestion and then we will try to do FMR. In fact, uh, it was our plan. But okay. because of some reasons, we couldn't do FMR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> actually uh, there are other people waiting, so maybe I will come back to you later. Yeah. Uh, Professor Andreas Berger, so please uh, unmute and ask. 
Okay, yeah. So thank you for the presentation. I also wanted to ask regarding the anisotropy. I mean, I think the 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 argument is correct that if it's isotropic, it should be circular. So there is a even though it might be rather modest deviation uh, from isotropy here. But I would like to know what is the meaning of the angles there? What does zero degree mean in so, terms of the sample? In terms of the sample, we try to uh, vary the sample plane at different angles and try to measure the positivity and exchange bias. Right, but what is zero? What what sets the value zero? The zero means like uh, um, uh, we have a film, and then we try to make sure that uh, the magnetic field is applied along uh, the length of uh, the film. So, but it has because I, the the question I'm really asking is what is the origin of that anisotropy? Because uh, you you are depositing on a um, amorphous substrate, so there should really be no in-plane uh, anisotropy, except, of course, you have a directional deposition process. Is so, that so, what you're having? Or? Yeah, so, so basically, like, uh, we try to deposit uh, um, these films on top of uh, um, a silicon, silicon dioxide substrate. And then uh, um, uh, we could see uh, a texture of uh, 110 direction for fe 2 cvs film. But that's the out of plane texture. That has no, nothing that, that really. Is, to, that is in nothing plane. to do with the in plane uh, that is, anisotropy. That is that is in plane only. We don't have out of plane magnetization in our film. It is in plane film. No, no, but the out of plane texture 111 doesn't mean anything regarding the in plane anisotropy that you see. They, they are not connected because the 111 texture just tells you what the uh, ordering perpendicular or along the surface normal is, not how it's oriented on your sample, right? So there must be a doubt. So you're not rotating your sample, I presume, while you're depositing. So, so we directly deposited these films on top of uh, silicon silicon dioxide using the sputtering system. Without sample rotation. With sample rotation. With sample rotation. With sample okay. rotation, yes, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> but just like I mean, actually, Andreas, it may be like the rotation speed, what they have taken maybe not sufficiently enough to overcome this uh, oblique angle of uh, induced uh, anisotropy. So we have also encountered this. Uh, if you go to very high rotational speed, you can. Okay. I, I think uh, I, I will send you some papers a uh, few years ago sure, sure. Um, to you, Surya, and you can look. And Andreas uh, also has published very nice papers. Uh, okay. So you can refer to that. Okay. At the end, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Pranava has some questions. Uh, hello. Hi. So in this uh, STT bias uh, part, Hmm. Did you consider the oyster field uh, from the current in your? Scenario? No, no, no. We didn't consider. We didn't consider. Okay, okay. That could have a significant impact. Yeah, we are. We also have a plan to do that one. We we have different set of uh, simulations that we are performing. So maybe this suggestion will help us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> and Dale had had a question. Hang on. Yeah, sorry. It was just following up on um, on Andreas's question. So you did some diffraction. Did you do any in-plane diffraction to look at the texture in the plane? Because this anisotropy is um, this anisotropy is interesting. Uh, it's clearly there is some anisotropy there, but understanding the origin of that is not clear at the moment. Okay, so I mean, like um, uh, as uh, Professor Subankar mentioned, like uh, in fact we had a plan to do fMR. Uh, to understand more about this anisotropy, but uh, because of some reasons we couldn't do this fMR, so we will plan to do that one. But uh, as uh, uh, according to your question, like um, we have done uh, uh, GIXRD, GIXRD at very small angle, and this is the kind of uh, X-ray diffraction pattern that we have obtained. 
just let me show you one minute uh, this is a kind of x-ray diffraction pattern that we obtained okay yeah okay thank you thank you that's all um so uh, just a follow up question on this uh, fe2 cobalt silicon mm. do you uh, really see the epitaxial nature or it's polycrystalline the host uh, so i mean like uh, we do we do observe only one peak from fe2 cobalt no i'm talking in, about the cross sectional tm you have i think images yeah cross sectional tm we, we do see many many because <laughs> cross sectional tm it actually gives uh, the local structure if if you take tem it will give in the local local region locally microscope uh, like uh, uh, at nanometer length scale it is fe2 csi like we do see many peaks but when you try to do xrd we do see only one peak mm. but but the tm image either is not good quality or uh... if it is good quality then we don't see any epitaxial nature then you will see the planes yeah so so we don't see we don't see any epitaxial nature because we do see many peak many hkl values over here hmm. so it is probably then polycrystalline although in x ray you are getting only one peak yeah one peak it may be polycrystalline yeah yeah it might be polycrystalline i agree with you yeah okay okay andreas i think wants to say something or No, no. I was just agreeing with that. So, no. Okay. Yeah. But I do have another question, but I don't want to jump in. Maybe that. No, no. Please, please, people. please, please go ahead. Yeah. The the my second question was related to the uh, uh, current induced bias that you saw. What actually goes into the calculation there? You assume a spin current that is yeah. uh, existing throughout the entirety of the sample. yeah so so basically the idea for uh, the spin transfer torque bias is as follows so just one minute yeah you have uh, a ferromagnetic infinitely long ferromagnetic nanowire it is not a short wire it is an infinitely long ferromagnetic nanowire so to uh, make sure that the wire is uh, infinite we neglected the surface charges surface charges and we try to send the spin polarized current through this nano wire so the, the the current that you assume is spin polarized yeah, is spin, the spin yeah, polarization spin of the, is the spin polarization of the current depending on the magnetic state of the wire we we send the spin polarized current through the nano wire but is it dependent on the magnetic state of the wire i would yes. assume your answer is no uh magnet we didn't consider the magnetization state of uh, the wire for the spin polarization of the the current no we we so, send different spin polarized current through the nano wire right but what is the source what do you envision the source of that spin polarized current to be the spin polarized current like uh, it is like uh, um uh, we wanted to create some kind of uh, the spin transfer torque in the system No, no, I understand, but where should it come from? Where is it coming from? Because you're saying it's it is, not. It is, it is simulation, actually. It is. It is from the simulation. No, no, I know, but you were saying uh, that that uh, you were ho hoping you find an experiment. But if you assume a fixed spin polarized uh, current that oh. is not dependent on the magnetic state of the sample. Yeah, it doesn't depend on the magnetic uh, state of the sample. Yes. then i think i'm not surprised you get the bias but of course i think you cannot really realize that because if you send a current through this wire mm -hmm. it has a certain spin polarization of course depending on the spin polarization of your electrons at the fermi surface however okay. once the magnetization switches the spin uh, current switches too and that's not in your calculation right yeah that's not in our calculation yes yeah okay All right. I think now so, I understand so, that. So we we try to we try to uh, um, 
explain this phenomena using the domain wall resistance, as I have mentioned, using the uh, non adiabatic spin transfer torque term. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a follow up question on this. <clears throat> so, what is actually the magnetization state in the nanoware? Is it in plane magnetized or yeah, it, is, it, is, it is in X direction. <clears throat> it is in the X direction. Is in X direction, yes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, there is a question in the chat box from Sriram. How are you defining the domain or grain density on MFM images? Can you explain the for FFT on, on MFM? How are you claiming that anisotropy exists using FFT? So anisotropy uh, exists, just one minute, yeah. See the anisotropy uh, exists in the anisotropy based upon the shape of four, based upon the shape of four, the polar plot. Suppose if, uh, uh, if you have a circular polar plot, that means it is uh, isotropic. But if you have a lobe kind of thing, so that is uh, uh, fourfold anisotropy plus twofold anisotropy. If the lobe expands in four different directions, it is a fourfold anisotropy. If uh, the lobe expands only in this fashion, in this fashion, it is uh, uniaxial anisotropy. So this is how we define the anisotropy in the polar plot. Yeah, then he's asking is, uh, can you explain the FFT on MFM? How are you claiming that anisotropy exists using FFT? Okay, so see, like, uh, what is uh, uh, MFM? MFM, it is basically the phase, the phase signal. Okay, so this phase uh, signal will also have some information about uh, the anisotropy. So basically, uh, FFT means what? Fast Fourier transform. Fast Fourier transform. And we try to take, uh, um, just one minute. Yeah, let me just add to it because I'm also not very sure about this. Uh, I have also doubts. Okay. Uh, if you have a perpendicularly magnetized sample, hmm. okay, you see these uh, uh, Leibniz kind of domains. Okay. Let's say cobalt platinum or some other perpendicular magnetized sample. Hmm. How the effect will look like? Uh, we have not explored that one. So we try to plot only for this uh, in-plane sample. Because how can you then say that it is perpendicularly magnetized? Because most of the MFM studies are actually done on perpendicularly system. Perpendicular so, system, but we also try to do for the in-plane sample. Oh, that's by true. By making but, some angle, uh, we have, we try to apply magnetic field with some angle huh. so that we get some uh, magnetic phase information. <clears throat> okay, you are showing those images because I have also similar question in mind from yeah. um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, this one. So initially we, we, we have taken MFM and then we have taken um, FFT, the fast Fourier transformation. Uh, then um, depending upon uh, the size of uh, uh, this FFT, like if you look, uh, this lobe expanded uh, in all four directions, all four directions. And from this, um, we say that uh, it might be, it is having some indication. It, it is giving some indication uh, towards the fourfold and twofold anisotropy. And this was taken at multiple places or just like few places? Just at a few few places. And just you always got for the, for the, for the huh? Hello? Always got reproducible uh, similar oh, reproducible thing. Yes, yeah. And so in fact, like uh, in fact, like uh, we also have taken FFT on various uh, films, uh, which I didn't show. Uh, I'll show just one minute. Yeah, so did you check FFT, let's say, on a perf perfectly uniaxial system? Then how the FFT looks like? Just one minute. All right. I, I didn't show because they are unpublished results. That's why I didn't show. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you look at uh, this system, hmm. this system, we do see this kind of behavior for the FFT. And if you look at this system, the shape of the FFT is different. This is a completely uniaxial system. Okay. 
I mean, are there other people reporting on this FFT correlating to? Yeah, there are, there are few papers. There are few papers. Okay. okay. Maybe I can share you those papers with you. Yeah, that that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not very clear because if uh, fast Fourier transform basically kind of replicates the kind some kind of correlation function and uh, you are mimicking the anisotropy that's very interesting uh, so i mean like it is it, it doesn't give a complete information about the anisotropy at least it gives some indication okay so yeah. since uh, since this matches uh, with uh, the polar plots we are yeah, saying that it, since okay. this is matching with the polar plus, we are saying that it might be having uh, the fourfold anisotropy along with twofold anisotropy. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, if not, uh, then I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, uh, Surya, could you please stop the uh, screen sharing? And I would like to share my screen for yeah. Yeah, sure. a yeah. small token of appreciation. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, do you see my screen? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so that is a uh, small, uh, um, uh, what to say? Uh, okay, so I will read it for you. Uh, W2S uh, seminar, uh, that is webinar series on spin tonics. Uh, I'm sorry, I think some issue is there. Let me share again. Uh, yeah, now I think you can see. Yes, I read it. Uh, so it's a small token of appreciation from our team. So webinar series on spin tonics, uh, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, NICER, Bhubaneswar, India. Takes uh, pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Sudan Narayanan uh, from the Department of Physics, IIT Hyderabad. In recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on domain wall dynamics and spin transport torque bias, STTB in an inverse hoister alloy nanostructure. So thank you so much, uh, Sudhya. Thank you. Thank this you. very nice talk and a uh, lot of appealing uh, research work. I hope uh, we can uh, interact more. Certainly. And, uh, yeah, so uh, very good. So all of you, uh, thank you so much for joining. Next week, a uh, very interesting talk will be there by Professor Andreas Berger, whom you just saw in the audience. And uh, next week, at, again, at same time, uh, same day, uh, 8 p.m. on Thursday, we will meet. Until then, please be safe and healthy and have a good night or have a nice day ahead. Uh, yes, 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 you are. Yes, yes. Thank you. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.